From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV audiences and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Kaylee Lines, I'm Joe Matthew. $83 million. That's how much a jury says former President Trump must pay E. Jean Carroll for defaming her. We'll have more on that and his other legal challenges with law professor Rebecca Royfe. Dead on arrival. That's how House Speaker Mike Johnson describes a potential border deal coming from the Senate that would unlock aid for Ukraine as Donald Trump, meantime, works to squash. In agreement. And an oil tanker is on fire after being struck by Houthi missiles off the coast of Yemen. Former Representative Jane Harmon of the Commission on the National Defense Strategy will be with us for more on the Middle East. But Joe, we have to begin with the breaking news we got just yep. minutes ago. $83 million is what a New York jury has ordered Trump to pay Eugene Carroll. Of course, he had already been found liable for sexual assault and defaming her. Now we know how much he has to pay for it. And in short order, a response from the former president yeah. on True Social. He says, absolutely ridiculous. I fully disagree with both verdicts and will be appealing this whole Biden-directed witch hunt focused on me and the Republican Party. Cue the retribution tour. I have to admit that's actually pretty tame uh, for some of the stuff that we've seen on Truth Social, his commentary about E. Jean Carroll and about the judge. You wonder if he wrote that himself, Kaylee, because this is a story that's going to follow him on the campaign trail, along with, as we know, four indictments in federal court. Absolutely. So that is one of the many stories we have to cover this evening. And joining us to do so are Bloomberg's Gregory Cordy, Jennifer Louie, and Enda Curran. So, Gregory, let's begin with you as you focus on 2024 and President Trump's myriad legal issues do have a major factor in this election cycle. He's been found liable for sexual assault, for defamation. He has to pay $83 million as a result. And yet the net effect of this may very well be it boosts him in this primary contest. We've seen this movie before, right? Uh, the, famously, just before the 2016 election, the famous Access Hollywood tape, which made a blip in the news cycle in the grand scheme of things. Uh, it, it doesn't seem to influence uh, his support in the polls. $83 million, though, is a lot of money. And we are now in an election year, and people are starting to pay attention to things that maybe they hadn't been paid attention to before. He's been adjudicated uh, in civil court, as guilty of sexually assaulting E. Jean Carroll. That's not nothing. And now a second jury now has, has determined that he defamed her as well uh, to the tune of $83 million. He will appeal. It's very possible that amount can come down. Appeals courts are often very skeptical of the punitive damages, which is a big part of this, uh, $65 million worth of it. Uh, and so there's a lot more to litigate. But as Trump is in court, in civil court, in criminal court, all over courtrooms, he's not on the campaign trail. He didn't do a fundraiser in Arizona this week because he was in court uh, fighting this case. And he's spending uh, tons of money in legal bills out of his campaign funds to fight these kinds of cases that he could be using for attack ads in battleground states. Yeah, you wonder how long he can actually campaign from the courtroom. So far, he's been pretty successful at doing that. But we do remember, and to your point, that that libel ruling was already out there some time ago. Does the dollar figure change anything for him politically? It's certainly a headline-grabbing number. He was uh, liable for $5 million in damages in the previous case. $83 million is something that might get people's attention. Um, but, and I don't know if, if it's as much about the money as it is uh, the, uh, just the cumulative effect of these, these verdicts and these trials over the course of the next year. And if you're a Republican, you've got to be thinking, uh, okay, like, is this... Uh, does this damage his electability? So far, it has. It, it's only uh, bolstered his support among Republicans. Independent voters will just have to wait and see in November. Gregory Cordy, we thank you for being with us on the breaking news this evening. Meantime, the White House announcing new restrictions for the energy sector. National Climate Advisor Ali Zaidi speaking to reporters earlier today. The Biden-Harris administration is announcing a pause on pending applications to export liquefied natural gas to non-free trade agreement countries uh, from here in the United States. The department's pause will remain in effect until the agency updates key economic and environmental analyses. 
driving our coverage on this today. Bloomberg's Jennifer DeLuey with us in studio in Washington. Jennifer, we've seen reviews like this before. Why does it have to come with a pause? Well, it doesn't, and that's a, certainly an argument that we're hearing from the oil industry and its allies mm -hmm. on Capitol Hill. Uh, in 2012, Obama undertook a very similar study, came with a two-year pause. It was before the election. Yes, But subsequent that. analysis has been done concurrent with reviews. Here, of course, this could take us well past the November election, and for some uh, advocates of the president, that's uh, an attribute. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a tough, tough issue for the president. Uh, it really uh, drives... Uh, uh, a wedge with uh, climate activists. These approvals were fiercely fought and they were demanding an end to them. And uh, obviously putting this decision off, these decisions off until after November causes uh, some, eases some of that friction before Election Day. On one side, sure. On the other side, maybe not so much. We've certainly seen some pretty harsh responses from members of Congress. The Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, has said this is outrageous. And even a Democratic senator, Joe Manchin of West Virginia, who chairs the uh, Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, says he's going to investigate this. And if he finds this really is mostly politically motivated, he'll do everything he can to stop this pause from taking place. How contentious could this be moving forward? Oh, you know, we're only seeing the start of it. I mean, this is this is already, uh, a, you know, a fierce fight. On, on the Hill, where Republicans are, are going to be looking for every avenue to stop it, and they will have help from allies, potentially, like Democrat Joe Manchin, as well as some other vulnerable Democrats. There's obviously uh, going to be an attempt to uh, affect this through the debate and on a deal on immigration and spending. That's a possibility that there could be some legislation to intervene and stop this pause moving through that process. Uh, you know, we're also hearing quite a lot from the Hill about what this means for European allies, and there's a real effort to ensure that European uh, leaders make their voices heard and uh, get a little bit more active in complaining about this. Yeah, the U.S. is providing a lot of LNG to Europe because Europe had to cut off That's the right. Russian flow. Jennifer DeLuey, thank you so much for your terrific reporting on this. Now, turning to the wider issue of the U.S. economy, and certainly energy, energy prices do play a factor, U.S. Deputy Treasury Secretary Wally Adeyemo says the economy is in better shape than that of any other major country in the world, but added there's still more work to be done. We know that there's more that we need to do in terms of trying to make sure that we put more pocket in the more money in the pockets of the middle class in America, and that that's exactly what the president and the secretary committed to doing. We, we're, we're not declaring victory; rather, we're saying we've made progress, and we can, we're going to continue to make that progress going forward. And joining us now is Bloomberg's Enda Curran. And Enda, speaking uh, of progress being made going forward, we got some economic data today that arguably was pretty good news for the administration. Personal spending doing pretty well, and the Fed's preferred inflation gauge going in the right direction, which is down. Yeah, it's been a very strong week in terms of economic data, Kaylee. As you mentioned, the core inflation numbers coming in there at the slowest in three years. You had the strongest back-to-back -back, uh, monthly performance for consumer spending in a year. Of course, that comes a few days after we had the blowout GDP data earlier this week. But all of that is kind of in the rearview mirror now, confirming that, you know, last year was a obviously a great year for the economy, but it's also probably as good as it gets. We've already had a noticeable tick up in the number of layoffs being announced in different sectors of the economy throughout the month of January. We will get new jobs data next week, which of course will shed light on where just how strong the jobs market is or isn't. But, you know, while there's a feeling that things obviously have been, are in a good space right now, you'd have to say the soft landing camp is in control. There are certainly pockets of weakness that some economists are keeping a close eye on as well. You see, this is as good as it gets. And uh, if you're the White House, though, why not take victory for the soft landing? Isn't this it? Well, this is one of the views that's out there, and especially when it comes, by the way, to the debate over the Federal Reserve. Uh, look, one camp is arguing, take the win, call it a soft landing, and start bringing down interest rates. They don't have to be where they are. Uh, but, of course, there's a cautionary tale on the other side of that, both for the administration and, of course, the Fed. Uh, nobody wants to declare a victory only to see inflation return with a vengeance. There are some worry spots out there. Keep an eye on what's going on with the Red Sea and how that impacts both energy costs, shipping costs, and eventually how that flows through to the cost of goods on the counter. Again, things are in a much better place right now than many would have thought even a year ago. But uh, there's a fair degree of caution, I think, around declaring mission accomplished. All right, our thanks to Bloomberg's and the current. Thanks for the insights and, uh, and great reporting today. Coming up, attacks from Houthi rebels targeting an oil tanker now in the Sea of Aden, south of Yemen today. We'll discuss with former Congresswoman Jane Harmon, chair of the Commission on the National Defense Strategy, next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. I'm Joe Matthew alongside Kaylee Lines. Attacks by Houthi rebels in Yemen appear to have escalated, with an oil ship now being struck by missiles today in the Gulf of Aden. We're joined now by Jane Harmon, chair of the Commission on the National Defense Strategy and former congresswoman from California. Jane, we have a few things we'd like to talk to you about, but I wonder your thoughts on what is happening here with a ship on fire. Clearly, the eight, I believe, strikes conducted by the U.S., some of which we shared with the U.K., are not stopping Houthi rebels. What can we do here without escalating a very tense situation in the Middle East? Well, this story is rich, as I understand it. The tanker is Russian-owned. Uh, oops. Yeah. Uh, I don't think the Houthis meant to do that. And it's quite amusing that the U.S. is trying to prevent tankers, maybe even including Russian tankers, from being hit by this uh, terror group uh, funded and trained by Iran. Um, what can we do? Uh, we can just hit the targets, and we're pretty good at this, uh, where the missiles are coming from. That's what we should be doing. This is international water, and we are protecting shipping uh, in the Middle East, and it's, it's the proper role of the United States. And sadly, uh, Iran is continuing its mischief along various borders of Israel and now also, obviously, in the Red Sea and, the, and, the, and, and, and uh, near Aden. So uh, I, I, you know, I applaud the Biden administration for doing the right thing. Well, Jane, it's interesting to hear you describe this essentially as an accident, an oops, if you will, except this is an oops with incredibly high stakes. Is that not really the biggest risk with yeah. how tense things are in the Middle East right now is of miscalculation or, or an accident that turns into something yeah. much more severe? I think that has been a huge risk from the beginning. Uh, but I think uh, uh, it's a good thing that Bill Burns is headed over there, hopefully to try for uh, the return of some prisoners all would be a good number uh, and 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 a pause in at least a pause in the military strikes in Gaza. I, I, I don't see the, uh, an end game in this direction that makes any sense to me. The goal is to tamp this down. And uh, I'm strongly for and I think the Biden administration is too a path not immediately, but a path to two states, not to reward uh, Hamas. Hamas should not be part of any new uh, government, or certainly not a lead role in any new government in the Palestinian Authority, if there is one, and Gaza, those combined. It should not be. Uh, but I, I think Israel's security will be um, far more secured by a deal uh, where there's de-weaponization of, the entire, uh, 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 of of the entirety of Gaza, plus uh, good governance that leads to two states living side by side in peace. Yeah, we're dealing with obviously a couple of situations here, but one debate in Washington over uh, the border would impact the situation in both Israel as well as Ukraine. Jane, uh, we can get into the border dispute, but it looks like it's on ice for right now. The Speaker of the House says it's DOA, and we've been talking uh. about what Ukraine would look like if the money in fact were cut off. And I asked Melinda Herring of the Atlantic Council about that earlier today on Bloomberg. Here's what she said. If we do not provide this assistance, Ukraine is going to lose and it is going to be our fault and it is going to threaten Western security for the next 50 years. Could NATO get drawn in? Absolutely. Putin's plan is to reconstitute his forces uh, and he may go after a NATO member next. Does that automatically pull the U.S. in? It does not automatically pull it in. But under the Article 5 guarantee, if a NATO mm -hmm. member were hit, they would have to have a discussion and they would likely defend that territory. So it would involve the United States. Can you put a finer point on that, Jane Harmon? What will happen to Ukraine in the weeks and months that follow money being cut off from the United States? Well, I, let me make a several points on that. First of all, it's essential that we provide the funds. Uh, we have pledged the aid. We need to follow through. Uh, the U.S. cannot get a reputation, which it sort of got after we left Afghanistan, that it walks away uh, from pledges that it makes. This would be very bad. Secondly, Israel, it, Europe is hesitating because we're hesitating. So there's more money at stake urgently uh, that Ukraine needs. Uh, my recommendation would, would be to do what has been recommended by Lawrence Tribe, Harvard Law School professor, uh, and, and I think he's right, which is to use the frozen funds uh, from Russian assets right now, which I think Biden has the authority to do. George H.W. Bush did this uh, when uh, 
Uh, there was the invasion of Kuwait by Iraq. He was able to freeze funds and then use them uh, for this purpose, use those funds for the moment as a stopgap to give the money to Ukraine. It's, it's ridiculous uh, that Congress is not acting. A majority of Congress favors the aid. Uh, a majority of Congress also favors doing something about the border. And wouldn't it be sad if before he is elected, before he's even the nominee, what Donald Trump tells Congress to do is what Congress does instead of uh, what it has been prepared to do. It's a separate branch of government and what uh, a majority of voters in the country want it to do. Yeah, and that's something we've been exploring over the last several days is the kind of pressure the former president could be exerting on Congress to not do a, a deal like this. But it Something you hear raised in Congress often, Jane, is the idea that there is no plan that the Ukrainians have or that U.S. authorities have shared to actually win the war, bring about an end to a war, and that what a lot of them want is that kind of game plan. We're now almost two years into this thing, Jane. Is there really any chance of it coming to a conclusion soon? Oh, well, I certainly hope so. The goal would be uh, to give Ukraine the momentum and to have maybe a, a negotiation with Russia about an endgame when Ukraine is at its strongest. That's the point. Let's understand that Russia has not abided by ceasefires or pledges. In 1994, Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons in exchange for a promise by the world, including Russia, to respect its sovereignty. Uh, Russia is also a member, uh, they both are, of the United Nations, and the, the prime tenant there is to respect the sovereignty of other countries. So Russia doesn't play by any rules. And wouldn't it be ridiculous to let Russia win now when Ukraine has been fighting its heart out, as you said, as your reporter said, to protect the West and to to avoid getting the UN, the US and other NATO countries uh, involved in war with Russia? That's a much worse outcome. So uh, I think that aid now, what Ukraine needs, I have recently been in Europe and I also saw the Ukrainians in Davos. What they need is long range fires, uh, long range weapons that can, they can shoot into Crimea, which is part of Ukraine, occupied by Russia, but part of Ukraine to take out the Russian installations that are used to lob the missiles into the other parts of Ukraine. This could be easy to do. Lots of that long range fire is in Europe. I mean, part of the part of the aid that that we get in the U.S. gives our uh, in defense industrial base in the U.S. the money to backstop weapons that are in other places. And those are the weapons uh, that go into Ukraine. So our defense in industrial base makes money on this aid. I mean, this is a craziness. And I understand that it's somewhere in Europe. There are long range fires that could actually being targeted at the Karch Bridge, that's the, the landline between Russia and Crimea, that, that some of the uh, U.S. weapons, the long-range attackums, are not able to take out. But wouldn't that be uh, w a wonderful story, to block Russia mm. on the ground from mm. going into Ukraine to, ha to, f to uh, use its installations to, to hurt Ukraine? I think there could be a good outcome here. Congress needs to step up, mm. and the Biden administration yeah. should use these f frozen funds right now. All right, former Congresswoman Jane Harmon, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Now, coming up, we'll get more on the economic take from the White House with Heather Boucher of the Council of Economic Advisors. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Thanks for joining us. Falling inflation, strong GDP growth, low unemployment. Nice combination for Heather Boucher of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. She says it's all a sign that the administration's policies are working and joined us earlier from the White House here on Bloomberg. 
I like to think of this economy as the little engine that could. It is just chugging along. It is, um, you can see the strength in the reports from today and yesterday. Um, of course, we saw that growth was 3.1% last year. And, you know, over a year ago, forecasters were predicting that 2023 would be a recession, that we would see growth right. of negative 0.1%. And of course, that's not what happened. Um, we, we have seen this, um, this strength in the U.S. economy and alongside the ongoing strength in the labor market. And um, so so and and of course all of this uh, paired with the uh, softening of prices, so that price increases are not going as fast. Um, so we have a new low below three percent in the annual rate of the core PCE. But again, when you look over the last six months, both headline and um, and uh, core PCE are hovering at about two percent. So this is really good news. We're seeing this growth. We're seeing this investment. It's delivering for the American people in a way that is strong, shared, and um, across the country and we're also seeing that um, that, that uh, inflation has been cooling where are we going to be six months from now Heather is it possible to answer that question based on the trajectory that we are on uh, many forecasts would suggest uh, that you might in fact be at that two percent target that the soft landing will essentially be confirmed how does your crystal ball look well, I do not have a crystal ball, but here's what I can tell you. When you put all the pieces together of what we're seeing and you pair that with the investments that the president is making all across the country, game-changing investments in infrastructure, in um, advancing new technologies, in, in advancing clean energy, what you see in is an economy that is delivering now, having recovered from the pandemic, but one where we're making those game-changing investments that are going to drive productivity, growth, and jobs um, for years to come. And so so, you know, given just how strong these reports are, uh, this all looks very good. That was Heather Boucher of the President's Council of Economic Advisors speaking with me earlier here on Bloomberg. Kaylee, they're not putting up a mission accomplished banner in front of the White House. That's where they draw the line there. You know, some of his advisors like Heather Boucher will speak to the benefits of Bidenomics, but very careful to think about where we're going to be six months from now, as we were just saying with Enda Karim. Yeah, it's very difficult to forecast. Everyone had been forecasting a recession up until yes, recently, right. and now everyone is forecasting the soft landing or no landing scenario. But when groupthink kicks in, sometimes that's actually when you have to question How true. the outlook. Of course, we'll hear what the Federal Reserve is thinking about this next week. They have a mm -hmm. decision coming up on Wednesday, and maybe we'll get a hint about whether or not cuts are actually coming. Yeah, she's not going to talk about the Fed. No. before or after that. Meeting. Yeah, they don't really like don't to do that, that, as we know. But coming up, we have to turn back to the breaking news we got this evening. $83 million is what Trump has to pay E. Jean Carroll for defaming her. We'll be joined by Rebecca Royfe, New York Law School professor, to discuss what happened in that courtroom today, this decision, and his other legal battles. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio, and the verdict is in. Trump ordered to pay E. Jean Carroll $83.3 million in damages for defaming her. Joining us now is Rebecca Royfe, New York Law School professor and former assistant district attorney for New York County. Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us this evening. This $83.3 million is made up of $18.3 in compensation, $65 million in punitive damages. Does this seem high? Is it likely to go lower on appeal? Because Trump says he will be appealing this. You know, it's really hard to tell because the question of punitive dam damages is so discretionary, and it certainly is in the realm of possibilities that the appellate court would cut that down um, on some level. I think um, there isn't, you know, a strong uh, argument for appeal, but it is um, such a discretionary thing that it's really hard to know. Just looking at the statement that we uh, saw quickly on Truth Social and uh, through now other means from Donald Trump, uh, he refers to this, Rebecca, as a Biden-directed witch hunt focused on me and the Republican Party. What role did Joe Biden play in this? Joe Biden played absolutely no role. There's no evidence that he played a role. There is no way in which he could play a role. Um, this is not um, run by the Department of Justice. This is a civil lawsuit brought by a private party. He doesn't control the courts, um, just as Donald Trump didn't control the courts when he was president. So that statement is absolutely false. 
Well, of course, this was a civil case, but there are uh, also many criminal cases that the president is, is staring down as he's been indicted on 91 felony counts. One of them here in Washington is, as of right now, slated to begin March 4th in pretty short order from here. How much do you think we could see all of these legal fights drug out? How many of them could actually happen before the election? Yeah, I think the key word here right now is delay. Uh, his tactic is delay. It has been working. We're waiting right now for a decision on the appeal about questions of the former president's immunity in that case. And um, the, that will be appealed once again to the Supreme Court. This could all be resolved fairly quickly. But again, you know, some of this is up to the courts and there, this, there is a ticking clock. Yeah, the Supreme Court maybe not even just having to weigh in on on the idea of immunity, but also on February 8th going to be hearing arguments in the 14th Amendment case uh, after Colorado kicked him off the ballot on on those grounds. Just on these questions and on the Supreme Court, do you foresee any scenario in which they would be ruling against the former president? We always keep in mind here that three of these justices were appointed by him. Yeah, I really think that the fact that there were three justices who were appointed by him is irrelevant. Um, I, you know, obviously, it's not totally irrelevant in that the way that, um, you know, different justices look at the law is in part comes from their background and their beliefs. But I don't think that they would in any way be indebted to the former president simply because he nominated them. Um, and so, you know, I don't think that that's going to play a huge role. But I also don't see the Supreme Court in its current makeup as deciding the substantive issues that would actually allow states to kick him off the ballot. My guess, and this is purely speculation, is that they will find a way to decide this case on a more procedural ground, a kind of off-ramp that makes it such that he remains on the ballot, but they haven't decided whether or not he's engaged in insurrection whether or not a president counts as an officer under the 14th Amendment, which is another critical question in that appeal. Well, I guess it was a pretty bizarre day uh, in court today, Rebecca. Donald Trump stormed out at one point, and his, uh, his attorney, Alina Haba, was threatened with prison uh, for her behavior. Do you see turnover coming in the legal team as he endeavors to, to navigate these next trials? You know, it's possible. He's always running that line where, you know, he wants, um, he thinks he knows what's best for him and he wants an attorney who's going to do exactly what he wants. But sometimes that doesn't work out exactly as planned. I think that storming out of the courtroom really did him a disservice because, of course, what the hmm. court is, the jury was deciding in part was what will it take in order to make him respect and abide by a jury verdict? And then by storming out, it makes him look like he has no respect for the jury. And so that was really a bad move, I think, on his part, not strategic. And again, lawyers who would be serious lawyers would push back and make sure he didn't do anything like that. But, uh, you know, there's also his personality. He doesn't like people pushing back and he probably thinks that he has better judgment on these issues. Something else we wanted to ask you about, Rebecca, is what's happening in Georgia, where, of course, the district attorney, Fonnie Willis, in Fulton County has brought charges against him and a multitude of other defendants. But it seems like we're running into a little bit uh, of a snag here. Donald Trump joining a bid to disqualify her from pursuing that case because of claims she had an affair with the lead prosecutor. How badly could this get derailed by these accusations? You know, I, I think it casts a shadow over the prosecution. Uh, it's essentially favoritism. Uh, it's like, you know, picking your brother or picking your best friend or your lover to have a plum job is uh, not a good thing in government. And it's bad for public officials to do that. And it makes her look bad. And the public is right to question her judgment. That said, I think the disqualification motion here should fail because none of those bad decisions affect the prosecution, the quality of the prosecution, the accuracy of the prosecution. Because her affair is with another prosecutor, there's no way in which that would affect the underlying charges. So I don't think disqualification is the right consequence um, for a uh, public official engaging in this kind of conduct, but it is bad. She was accused as well of, of acting uh, in, in, in racist fashion, according to the complaint here. I don't even understand what that means on a legal basis, Rebecca. Will that be considered as part of 
as part of this? You know, I, I think if he had facts to prove that she was racist, then that could go to prosecutorial misconduct. But I think there's very little evidence that or I mean, there's no evidence that she has right. acted in any way um, out of racial animus here. It, it you know, it it's just one of those refrains that the former president likes to use in order to undermine mm -hmm. um, somebody who has acted in a way that's against his interest. And so, you know, I, I, I don't think that there's any legal merit or factual merit to that claim. If there were, it would be a legitimate claim, but it just, you know, it just likely is rhetoric. And of course, there's already a number of defendants in this case who have reached plea deals. And I, and I just wonder how, if, if there were to be an issue with Willis getting disqualified or something, what happens to everything that already has been agreed? Does everything get thrown out, hypothetically? Um, I mean, you know, they could they could move to withdraw their, their pleas. Theoretically, it's an extremely high hurdle to do. Um, so my guess is not. But again, I really don't think that these motions are going to go anywhere because it's not a conflict of interest. It is, you know, petty corruption, favoritism, nepotism. None of those things are good things, but they are not a conflict of interest that affects the underlying case. So I, I um, can't see those disqualification motions going anywhere. Um, and therefore, I think sort of a theoretical question about what would happen with those other plea deals. We always learn something when we talk to Rebecca Royfe. Thank you, Rebecca, for being with us from New York Law School here on Bloomberg. Coming up, our closers will be with us after a long week in politics as we go beyond New Hampshire and look ahead to the battle over the border and Ukraine funding in Congress with Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano. They're next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. House Republicans, they have a choice to make, right? They have to choose whether they want to solve a problem, actually solve a problem like the Senate is trying to do in a bipartisan way, uh, and or, you know, get in the way and score political points. That's a decision that House Republicans have to make. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre a bit earlier joining us now, our political panel, Rick Davis, partner at Stone Court Capital, and Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University. We call them our closers, and here they are at the end of a long week in politics. We're going to get to the New Hampshire primary, South Carolina, and, and some of the other big themes of the week here, Rick. But we, we end with some tough news on this border deal, and there are questions whether this is even possible. Speaker Johnson today says what he's hearing, and of course we haven't seen the text, is DOA in the House. Donald Trump is pressuring Republicans in both chambers to kill this deal. Are you writing it off yet? You know, as you say, I mean, nobody's actually seen the text other yeah. than the negotiators. And so everybody's posturing, and it's not on the policy, it's on the politics. And the politics is bad right now. I mean, Donald Trump, uh, you know, won these two primaries back to back, and now he's laying down the law. I'm going to be your nominee, and I don't want this. And certainly the House reacts to him much more than the Senate does, but even the Senate is starting to bend to his will right now. And so the politics are against it. The policy is for it. Who's going to win? Mm. The politics are against it in the presidential race for Donald Trump, perhaps, but doesn't this just further endanger all of the Republicans in Congress who also are facing elections in November, Rick? I mean, what does this mean down the ballot if you had a chance to vote for a border deal and you didn't? Well, it depends on where you're from. You know, core Republican districts are going to reward this because they're going to go home and say, we can't do a half a loaf. We've got to do the full loaf. We've got to have a comprehensive plan. The Senate wasn't going to give us that. They were going to be easy on parole and things like that. And they'll, and they'll demagogue it, right? And, and they're good at that. That's, that'll be fine for them. It's these guys who uh, are in Biden districts mm -hmm. for Republicans who are going to have a very hard time explaining, one, we didn't go for the $14 billion that Biden offered us, you know, to put on the border, because that would have actually helped somehow. And, um, and, you know, we didn't do anything in our term of office this last two years to deserve getting reelected because we actually didn't tighten the border. And every district in America wants a tighter border. There's nobody out there who's saying... Oh, the Biden administration has been fine on this. Everything worked out fine. Nobody believes that. Even the Democrats 
would like to show that something was done even beyond what Biden is offering. They're willing to extend their interests to securing the border, but they're not going to get a chance to vote on it, it looks like. All right, Jeannie. So what's the strategy for Joe Biden here? There were uh, critics who said he got involved too late in this process. But you've got the Homeland Security Secretary sitting at the table here and a potential vote on his impeachment coming. What can Joe Biden do to try to interrupt the chaos here? Because he seems to be losing the leadership. Is, is Mitch McConnell the key still for Joe Biden? You know, I don't even think Mitch McConnell is is the key anymore. I don't think we're going to see a border deal. And I think that's unfortunate for all of us, for the entire country. Republicans have been saying very loudly and rightly for some time the border is in chaos. And to borrow Mitt Romney's words and Tom Tillis's words, it is appalling and immoral that they would put the politics of this ahead of the policy, as Rick called it. But that is precisely what is going to happen. And it's going to be very, very difficult for voters going to the polls in November. Who do you hold responsible for this? Republicans are pointing the finger at Democrats, but wait, it is the candidate leading the party for the nomination to be president who is putting the brakes on this along with the Speaker of the House. And so voters are going to end up feeling rightly frustrated, and we will enter next year with a new Congress and the same challenge we've had on the border for decades, quite frankly, now. It is in crisis. It needs to be resolved, and it should be resolved. But unfortunately, it won't, given it's an election year. Well, Jeannie, because you brought it up, let's hear directly from the Republican senator from Utah, Mitt Romney, what he had to say about all of this. I think, I think the border is a very important issue for Donald Trump. Uh, and the fact that he would communicate to uh, Republican senators and Congress people that he doesn't want us to solve the border problem because he wants to blame uh, Biden for it is, uh, is really appalling. But on the subject of Biden, Jeannie, knowing that he faces this challenge on the border in a general election, that the former president would like to be able to use it against him as an issue argument leading up to the general, assuming it is a rematch of 2020, is there not more he could do unilaterally? Some executive orders, some tighter enforcement? Should he just be taking his own individual action here if Congress isn't going to work out for him? Yeah, he might have to go the way of Barack Obama and take to the pen and issue an EO, as you talked about. It's not the way we should be doing immigration policy. You don't want the president. It's not the way we do it constitutionally. It's got to be done via the legislature. But since this is a do-nothing Congress, he might have to do that. And that is something that Joe Biden has contended with for a long time. But, you know, it took Barack Obama, what, five years to decide he had to give up on Congress and do it that way. And he did. Joe Biden may end up feeling the same way. But again, this is not the way we should be running our government. The Congress has got to lead on immigration reform, particularly given the numbers we're seeing at the border. To put Donald Trump's interest above the interests of the American people is something that Republicans are going to have to look in the mirror about when people go to the polls in November. Rick, you've made the point that Mitch McConnell might be up to something uh, less obvious here, maybe a little bit of 3D chess, trying to push the negotiation through his comments publicly. Could he work with Joe Biden on a standalone Ukraine bill that would ever stand a chance to pass here? Or are we beyond that now? Uh, I think time is running out. Uh, I think he's got plenty of uh, capability to get that through the Senate. I think the, the, the issue is going to be whether or not, even in an overwhelming vote in the Senate, can they force the House to take a vote. If they force the House to take a vote, it'll pass. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of Republicans and Democrats who want to see Ukraine funded. And this is the real crime That's amazing. on Ukraine funding, is there's vast majorities in the House and Senate who want to do it, and it's the leadership can't get seemingly a yeah. deal in place to fund these guys. And, and, of course, time's running out in Ukraine, too. Well, and then there's the question of Johnson's speaker's gavel and the idea that he may be faced with a motion to vacate if he brings Ukraine aid to the floor because Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene has threatened that. So that's a consideration here as well. Well, Rick and Jeannie will be staying with us because coming up, we have to turn to 2024 in South Carolina. Both Trump and Biden are setting their sights in the Palmetto State as the race heats up in presidential terms. We'll be back with Rick and Jeannie on that next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio live from Washington. While President Joe Biden and Republican presidential frontrunner Donald Trump are both looking to South Carolina as they gear up for what is looking highly likely to be a 2020 rematch in 2024. Back with us is our political panel, Rick Davis, partner at Stone Court Capital, and Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University. And Jeannie, a headline had actually just crossed the Bloomberg terminal that on Tuesday, Biden's going to be in Florida for campaign events. It feels like he's starting to ramp things up. Is he right to be treating this at this point like it is? the general election with Nikki Haley still in the race and South Carolina being her home state? Yeah, I mean, I think many of us have been saying he should get ramped up a little bit earlier, so I'm happy to see they are. They had some changes in the upper echelons of the campaign, Um, so he put uh, some people who have been with him for a long time into the campaign arm, and they have been out and making their case. And I think when you step back and you look at the week Joe Biden, unlike Donald Trump, has had a pretty good week. Everything from the UAW endorsement to the good news on the economy to talking about issues that matter to people like gun control, like abortion. And of course, to your point, going around and he's got a lot of money to do this, keep raising money and contesting this thing against somebody who has just been found liable of of defamation and because of a sexual assault uh, guilt. So, you know, he is got had a good week, but he's going to have to be out there and pushing because for all the good economic news, for instance, you wouldn't know it looking at his poll numbers. So he's got to keep trying to shore that up. Rick, I want you to bring us to South Carolina because you know what it's like to roll into South Carolina and hit the buzzsaw (laughs) and some pretty dirty politics. It has been home, at least, to some pretty dirty politics, dirty pool over the years. Uh, certainly in presidential campaigns. What is Nikki Haley in for the next several weeks? Yeah, it's going to be tough. You're going to unravel years of good therapy on my behalf. <laughs> oh, God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Look, I mean, people in South Carolina like their uh, politics served up raw, right? It, they, they see politics as a blood sport. Wow. They play it locally. It's tough stuff. Mm-hmm. They're, they're, they're a very experienced constituency down there, just like Iowa, just like New Hampshire. They get the candidates there. Uh, uh, it's very hard to win a nomination without South Carolina, and they know it, and they're going to put you through your paces. But they are also used to very ugly campaigns. This is the home of Lee Atwater, who yeah. invented negative campaigning the way we know it in the modern era, hmm. and he cut his teeth in South Carolina. He didn't bring it to South Carolina. South Carolina <laughs> gave it to Lee Atwater. Wow. And so That's uh, a lot. my own experiences with John McCain is the hardest stuff I've ever seen. In 2008, you know, everybody came after us in South Carolina in 2000. The Bush machine crushed John McCain in our campaign over a three-week period. And I think we're starting to see the evidence of that with uh, the Trump campaign going after Nikki Haley. Boy. Finally, Jeannie, on the subject of of Nikki Haley, it was pointed out to me by a terminal client today that if you look at the real clear politics betting odds on the 2024 Republican nomination, the odds of Nikki Haley getting it are down at 7 percent, 87 percent for Trump. Then for the Democratic nomination, 71 percent odds for Biden 10.8% Michelle Obama. (laughs) There is money being put to work here. Obviously, she has given no indication that she intends to run, but should we rule it out? I don't think we can rule anything out in this election. What what a great point by somebody on the terminal. It, you know, it, and it's fascinating that Donald Trump's odds are ahead of the incumbent president. It just speaks volumes. And by the way, where is Kamala Harris not getting any odds at that case? Roger Stone's been pushing this Michelle Obama idea since CPAC, Rick. Do you see anything there or, or, or The Rock or somebody completely out of the blue jumps in in a third party or whatever it might be? The Rock, we, the actor. That's yes. a, oh, Dwayne, Dwayne Rock, The Rock Johnson. Rock Johnson. Yes, yeah. sir. <laughs> Got it. Now I'm all on board with that. Um, yeah, look, no. Um, uh, look, there's always the outside chance that the president has an accident and cannot continue to campaign. Oh, jeez. Right? And, and I'd say that's the 10 percent odds. OK. Otherwise, he's going to be the nominee and he's going to go into the general election. And, and, and you're going to have a remake of 2020. And, and in many different ways, the country has not changed much in that period of time. Uh-huh. So at best, it's going to be a very yeah. divided country where, you know, the Michigans and the Pennsylvanias and yep. the Georgias and Arizonas will still decide. I guess that's no on the rock. I guess so. Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano are closers for one heck of a week. Thank you both. Check out the Washington Edition newsletter on the terminal and online. Thanks for joining us. Thank God it's Friday. We'll see you Monday. This is Bloomberg.